Region Europe is the international program of the University of Turin, pursuing a comprehensive knowledge of the European model of regional integration and of the EU as a global actor. The involvement of 45 guest lecturers coming from all across the world's most prestigious universities and institutions allows us to bring fresh and critical perspectives on crucial issues concerning European integration and the role of the EU in world affairs with a forward-looking approach. We want to introduce you to how the EU actually works from its beating heart, visiting its institutions and interacting with its actors. From its first edition, each year Region Europe has given the opportunity to more than 150 students coming from all over the world to gather and exchange views and experiences. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, and um, I'm really delighted to be here today with you and I'm um, honored by the invitation ever since early March when I had to leave uh, the UK where I'm based at the, War at the University of Warwick. I haven't had much uh, physical connection to the academic world, even though this format is not exactly about physical connection, but it still feels really good to be part of this uh, series. Uh, so. I've prepared a PowerPoint presentation to just make it a little bit easier for us to go through uh, the things I wanted to discuss. Let me now uh, put it on. I hope, yeah, it can be working now. Oh, it's not. And here we go. Uh, so as uh, I assume most of you have seen, I've been asked to talk about the Belarus crisis and its implications for the European Union and the EU's neighborhood. And I thought I will discuss a couple of <clears throat> uh, things within this context. But before I do, uh, I just wanted to emphasize or highlight the picture which I have on this uh, introductory slide where you see uh, the in-between uh, written here, but also, uh, you know, this beautiful cookie. Uh, so by having it on my slide, I just wanted to make the first point, which is Belarus is a country, and I, I'll, I'll now show you on the map, which, politically speaking, lies in between two centers of geopolitical gravity one being the European Union, and then on the other hand, Russia. Uh, of course, when it comes to geopolitics, we know that had this difficulty with calling itself uh, a geopolitical power, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. Uh, but nonetheless, if we try to look at uh, different issues we're going to talk about from a geopolitical angle, it's always important to keep in mind that there is this belt of countries and Belarus is part of that belt. Mr. Freyamran, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I see from the chat that the students can't see this, this slide. So I think that there is some problem with your connection. Okay, oh. so now it should be start sharing because we can see the PowerPoint uh, file, but still the slides has to come. I think it's just because your connection maybe is a little bit slow or Vabex is uh, having trouble processing all the people because we are more than 200 now connected. Oh, oh. Mm -hmm. So maybe let's just wait a moment or try and share it back again from scratch. So okay, close yeah. it and sharing it. I'll stop sharing this. Yeah, I think it's just, oh, okay, okay, it goes ah. <laughs> yeah, okay. we can stop sharing it, but. Let me go back to it and share again. Sorry for this. It might be the connection indeed. Is it okay now? Mm, it says that you're starting to share content. Uh, so I guess it might take a while uh, to for us to see it. But I mean, uh, we see that you're sharing something, but still the slides are not there. So maybe it's just about connection. Uh, I, I would suggest 
uh, to just go on and maybe wait a little bit until uh, uh, the light. Okay, there they go. They appear. Okay. Okay. If just let me know. Mark. Let, let yeah. me know in case the problem okay. occurs again. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, I, I think we need to keep in mind when talking to countries like Belarus that from a geopolitical angle, there is this belt of states, roughly speaking, situated in Eastern Europe uh, and Belarus alongside with uh, Ukraine and Moldova is part of that belt. And it, roughly speaking, those states lie in between two centers of geopolitical gravity. And from a structural point of view, this is an important characteristic, which tells us quite a lot about the foreign policies of those states, but also what kind of normally competing pressures those states uh, experience from bigger powers. And it, not, it is not necessary that all those bigger powers consider this kind of uh, arrangements from a geopolitical point of view, because as I said before, uh, many in the EU still have a problem with the very term geopolitics, because for a long time, what you would normally hear in Brussels would be that the EU does not play geopolitical games. And that's, I think, a fair point to me, given the ideas, priorities, and values which have driven the EU as an institution, but also the European Union's foreign policy. But nonetheless, for the countries which geographically find themselves in this part of the world, uh, it is very often still about the competing pressures, which in the end are political. Um, and in uh, 50, 60 minutes that we have for this discussion, a few things. I want to provide you with a short intro into Belarus politics so that uh, you have a better idea what kind of political context we're talking about. I want then to focus a little bit on the historical background in Belarus EU relations. I will then talk about Belarus foreign policy and uh, try to explain why I think this foreign policy has been uh, sort of cyclical in a way, going from what we call academically as omnibalancing to foreign policy hedging and then back to omnibalancing. And all this will help us to put together a context for the discussion about the present day political crisis in the country and then what this political crisis means for regional security and for EU's foreign policy and EU's activities and policies in the neighborhood, in, in the Eastern neighborhood. And then in the end, uh, we'll come to some conclusions, but those conclusions will rather be about questions, which I think become an, even more topical after we've gone through all the uh, material I want to cover today. the organizers and with your professors, uh, in the end, uh, I will be very happy to take uh, the questions you have. And I think you can start writing those questions as we go, but I'd rather prefer to deal with them uh, in the end. Okay, so uh, we are again back to, to the map and I, I hope you, you can still see this. Uh, I, I will be uh, uh, judging whether you can see it by looking at Marta because I, I, I now have her <laughs> picture on my screen. So Marta, please let me know. Um, so Belarus politics. Um, Belarus is a relatively young state. It got its independence in 1991. Before that, it was part of the Soviet Union. So when the Soviet Union broke, a thing, which were formerly constituent parts republics of the Soviet Union became independent states, and Belarus was among them. Uh, before 1994, uh, the country was a parliamentary republic, and it had those three, four years of real dynamic political life compared to more or less the same kind of political dynamism in most post-Soviet states. And then in 1994, uh, the then parliament, which was then called Soviet 
uh, Supreme Soviet uh, decided that the country should become presidential. And then the first presidential election took place in the summer of 1994. And the first president uh, won that election, and his name is Alexander Lukashenko. So, as you can tell, uh, ever since that time, we, we continue to have the very same person uh, governing the country, and his name is Alexander Lukashenko. Uh, he won that election with you know, a landslide victory. He was super popular across the country. I think he got more than 80% of the votes in the second round of the election. And of course, that provided him with extraordinary support and powers during those days. And quite early on, he started to turn this popularity into a, an authoritarian political system. So he initiated a couple of, of constitutional referenda, and uh, there were pretty much two aspects to those referenda. The first one was about his power, so he was trying to make sure that he has absolute control over all other uh, institutions in the country, including the government, but even more so the parliament, because for some time after he became president, uh, there were tensions between him and the parliament, and of course the parliament was trying to make sure that it remained relevant and its voice in the political system of the country remained crucial. And then Lukashenko, through those amendments to the constitution, which he uh, passed through referenda, he, he minimized the role of the parliament. Uh, the other angle to the referenda had to do with uh, Belarus relations with Russia. And Lukashenko, in those early days, was a big proponent of closer relations between Belarus and Russia. And as a result, he made sure that the Russian language became one of the two official languages and state languages. So we now have Belarus and Russian as two equal languages of the nation. And he also made sure that uh, Belarus would start integration processes with Russia uh, on the bilateral level. And that's how we got later on at the end of the 90s something which is called the Union State of Belarus and Russia, which is not a real state, but it's a very unusual form of bilateral integration, which makes the relationships between these two countries very close. Uh, and also on the multilateral level, uh, Lukashenko initiated that Belarus should join all those post-Soviet groupings that were basically led by Russia, including in the security realm for and, and the, the main one there is the Collective Security Treaty Organization. And in the economic realm, there were different kinds of organizations ever since. Now, uh, they all materialized in something which is called the Eurasian Economic Union. But the political side, as I said, he made sure that the institution of the president became absolutely dominating over everything else. So he based which turned uh, the political system into a consolidated authoritarian government. Uh, the parliament became pretty much a rubber stamp institution and political parties got a very limited role within the political system. Uh, suffice to say that the last political party to be registered in Belarus was registered in the early 2000s. So for about 20 years, the country had not seen any new political party registered. It might change now that we have the political crisis, and I'll talk about this a bit later, but so far that's been the reality, which also tells you a little bit about the uh, political system. And of course, political and civil liberties are quite limited because uh, this is an authoritarian government which wants to make sure that it controls everything. Uh, at the bottom of the, of the screen, you can see a quote from the Freedom House, which, as you know, monitors the state of freedoms and uh, political liberties in different countries. So it calls Belarus an authoritarian police state in which elections are openly rigged and civil liberties are curtailed. Um, I would say that sounds a little bit rough because still the situation, at least until a few months ago, and of course what we are having is a quite different story. But until a few months ago, 
the situation was still a little bit better. So it's an authoritarian state, but in recent years, there has been quite some openings in terms of public life, in terms of uh, the space which non-governmental organizations could use, and also some political initiatives. But it is very telling that one of the authoritative voices on uh, political freedoms in the world, which the Freedom House is, sees Belarus through these lenses. Also, in terms of foreign politics, uh, as I said, Lukashenko has been promoting this special relationship with Russia uh, from day one of his presidency. And uh, of course, the, the, the argument was very simple, and obviously it wasn't just Lukashenko, but the majority of society supported the idea. So the, the idea was we need to restore all those multiple connections to Russia, which the facts of the Soviet Union collapse broke. And by restoring those connections, primarily in the economic realm, we'll be able to make sure that all our industries work properly. We have markets for our goods. And that's going to be a way to uh, increase the well-being of the nation. And, uh, you know, the years after the early uh, 90s show that he, he was right in many respects. And because of that policy, uh, he really managed to bring back the uh, rate of economic growth, at least when you compare Belarus to some other post-Soviet states. Of course, on an ideological level, many people in those days, but even more now, would say that there was a wrong decision and that by focusing on uh, relations with Russia and not carrying out market-oriented reforms, Lukashenko undermined the future of the country and the future development of the country. But that's, of course, a different type of debate. We might uh, touch upon that a bit later. But I'm just trying to say that this relationship with Russia became the central uh, factor, the central driving force for Belarusian economy and for everything else which happens in the country. And as a result of that, something which we tend to call a grand bargain between Belarus and Russia emerged, where Belarus would, simply speaking, try to exchange its geopolitical loyalty in exchange for all sorts of economic benefits that it received from Russia, primarily discounted oil and gas, uh, prices for oil and gas, access to the Russian market for its goods, and also access to preferential credits, loans, and so on and so forth. At the same time, relations with the West and with the European Union in particular have not been particularly good uh, since Lukashenko came to power. So there would be periods where the relationship was fine, but mostly uh, it was all about tensions. And I'll talk about this right now. So while uh, Belarus-EU relations started in 1991, more or less like the EU's relations with other post-Soviet states. It got much worse. Uh, before Lukashenko came to power and uh, in his initial years as president, the two sides were in tense negotiations about how they should structure their relationship. And the central item on their agenda was something called partnership and cooperation agreement. And that's a, a type of agreement which the European Union concluded with pretty much all its uh, neighbors and countries in its extended neighborhood. The agreement was supposed to regulate relations in all different spheres with a special focus on economic cooperation, of course. Uh, but then when Alexander Lukashenko came to power, and especially after he uh, initiated several referenda, and the referenda were not recognized as legitimate by the European Union, and actually the whole political situation was heavily criticized by EU member states and Brussels, those problems began. As an immediate result of those problems, uh, the ratification of the Partnership and Cooperation Agreement was suspended. So before that, it was negotiating, signed, and the Belarusian parliament ratified it, 
several member states on the EU side started ratifying it as well. But then, uh, as I said, when the EU refused to recognize the legitimacy of the referenda and accused Lukashenko of violations of human rights and democracy, uh, the ratification process stopped. And in the end, it is a little bit ironic, but even today, which is uh, nearly 30 years later, on a technical level, the relations between Belarus and the EU are still regulated by an agreement which was signed back in 1989. And that was an agreement between not even the EU, but the European uh, economic communities on the one side and the Soviet Union on the other side. The agreement was about uh, regulating trade. So as I said, it's, it's, it's ironic and it's difficult to imagine, to believe it, but it's still true that uh, this remains to be the central legal piece between the two countries. Uh, so when the first diplomatic crises started to emerge and break out between Belarus and the EU, uh, the European Union would react with different types of sanctions. Uh, initially, the sanctions were about limiting cooperation and communication with official Minsk. And uh, in those days, the EU would decide that we still need to sustain cooperation with Belarus, but we'll focus on the societal level. And that's why uh, the EU started to provide assistance to uh, all sorts of NGOs in Belarus, but communication and contacts with the government were limited to uh, some pretty low key level. Of course, it wasn't the same throughout the whole period. Uh, some sanctions would be introduced, later lifted, and then reintroduced again, and we would see all those cycles. And normally, the cycles would be related to some political developments in Belarus. And since, as I said, this is a centralized, author consolidated authoritarian state where the president has superpowers, then most political uh, troubles would result from presidential elections because everyone understands that this is key to the whole system. And most of the elections, perhaps with the exception of the presidential election in 2015, would cause serious crises between uh, Belarus and the EU. At some point, the sanctions which the European Union introduced against official Minsk would amount to one of the most complete uh, CFSP sanctions regimes in force. CFSP stands for the uh, European Union's Common Foreign Security Policy, which means that the EU has already tried quite a lot in terms of uh, exerting pressure on Belarus. And the sanctions were, of course, primarily about targeting individuals, including Lukashenko, who the EU considered to be uh, behind all those violations of human rights, suppression of uh, freedoms in the country. But even some economic uh, elements of sanctions would be introduced, even though you probably know that according to the EU regulations, uh, I think it, the most important one being the commission's 2004 guidelines on sanctions, the EU is not supposed to introduce massive economic sanctions against a country because the belief is that massive economic sanctions harm the interests of common people, but the EU is more interested in targeting those who are really to blame uh, for all those violations. But in that realm of targeted sanctions, as I said, pretty much everything has been tried. Uh, we can have a separate discussion about how effective sanctions are, because I think Belarus is one of the most interesting cases to talk about the EU sanctions policy. But that's a slightly separate thing. Uh, two more uh, things I wanted to draw attention to here is that from time to time, at least after 2008, some periods of rapprochement uh, would take place. And they were related uh, again, if we look at all this from a geopolitical angle to something happening in the EU's broader neighborhood. As you remember, for example, in 2008, there was this but shocking war between Russia and Georgia. 
result of that war, of course, uh, the EU's and well, relations with Russia deteriorated very quickly and very dramatically. Belarus in those days would start behaving in an interesting way. So as I mentioned before, Belarus since 1996-97 it has been technically the closest ally of Russia. But at the same time, when well, that situation between Georgia and Russia emerged, uh, Russia recognized the breakaway territories of positive South Ossetia. And of course, Russia expected that Belarus should recognize those as well, because Belarus is its closest ally. But nonetheless, Belarus would not do that. And of course, Belarus would start sending all sorts of signals to the international community. First of all, saying that, look, we are an independent state. And even though for all those years we've been a kind of a geopolitical backyard of Russia, we still want to conduct our sovereign foreign policy. We have our own interests, which are predominantly aligned with Russia, but can sometimes be different. And this is the situation where our relations are different. We, uh, our interests are different, sorry. We don't like the fact that a country, namely Russia, uh, can enforce anything on our small estate by using force. And all those messages, I think, helped to promote a slightly different kind of negotiation between Belarus and the West and Belarus and the EU. And that's why for 2008, we saw several years of gradual rapprochement between the two countries. But unfortunately, it broke down already at the end of 2010. And you won't be surprised, it was again related to the presidential election, which happened in December 2010. The election resulted in a crackdown against the opposition in the center of Minsk. And several weeks later, the EU introduced another package of sanctions against Belarus, or more specifically, against about 250 individuals whom it called as uh, being behind those violations. And that uh, stopped the rapprochement for a couple of years. But then another geopolitically important situation occurred. It had to do with the Crimea and the Donbass. And once again, Belarus, while remaining Russian ally, took quite a different stance on all those developments compared to the Russian position. So first of all, it never officially recognized Crimea as part of Russia, even though, of course, Belarus had to do quite a lot of uh, interesting maneuvering to make sure that uh, that position did not lead to some dramatic developments between Minsk and Moscow. But as a matter of fact, as I said, and it's important to emphasize, Belarus did not recognize uh, the annexation of Crimea. And Belarus also took a very uh, special position on what was going on in the Donbass on that war. Uh, Belarus became uh, the venue for peace talks. And I think we'll see it. Oh, no. Uh, we'll see it later. But current slide. So those became the venue for peace talks. And you know that the most important agreement, which was supposed to help uh, resolve the situation in the, in the Donbass is called Minsk Agreement. Or to be more precise, there were two different Minsk Agreements. And Minsk Agreement 2 became the world's famous one and was concluded, of course, in Minsk because, as I said, Minsk offered itself as the venue. The venue was uh, preferable and convenient for all actors. And uh, it wasn't just a one-time thing, because part of those agreements was that the OEC would organize a contact group that would meet every second week in Minsk and deal with more specific issues between uh, Ukraine, the Donbass, and uh, ultimately Russia. So in that way, Belarus became part of this international arrangement, which helped it to step a little bit aside uh, from this confrontation between uh, Ukraine and Russia. And it also helped to initiate another rapprochement between Belarus and the EU. And I would say that rapprochement, which had lasted until very, very recently, was quite productive. At least a couple of agreements 
were achieved, namely uh, the one on visa liberalization, which is, of course, compared to what has been achieved between the EU and some other countries in Eastern Europe or in South Caucasus, which are part of those uh, of, of something called the Eastern Partnership, for example, Georgia, Moldova, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Ukraine. So what Belarus has achieved with the EU is, is much more modest, but still compared to where the relationship was like 10 years ago, progress has taken place. Uh, before before uh, continuing this discussion about Belarus EU relations, let me say a couple of words about Belarus and foreign policy in general. As you can already conclude from what I've said, there's always been this tension in Belarus and in Belarus foreign policy between the authoritarian needs of the government and let me say, let, let's say more structural needs of the country or something which we sometimes call the national interest. And that's why I would argue that there's been this cycle where the Lukashenko government would go from authoritarian omnibalancing to foreign policy hedging and back to omnibalancing. Omnibalancing is a concept which was offered, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in the beginning of the 90s by Stephen David. He said the behavior of mainly African countries or what was called third world countries during the Cold War. And he would argue that most of, the of those countries, which were also authoritarian, their foreign policy decisions based exclusively on the interests of their rulers. So the rulers would try to maneuver between the two superpowers of those days, namely the Soviet Union and the, and the USA, trying to understand which one of them would help the leaders to stay in power and to consolidate their power. And of course, Belarus of today is very much different from the uh, third world nations of the Cold War period. But I think this very concept helps us to understand the essence of authoritarian decision making. In times when the authoritarian leader feels threatened by uh, either internal opposition or someone externally. So when that period begins, the authoritarian leader tends to make foreign policy decisions based on his expectations about which foreign actor will help him or her to stay in power. And as I said, I think that at least part of Lukashenko's role in, uh, with this concept. And we have entered this period again now with the August 9 elections. And uh, because the EU and the West in general would usually consider all those elections illegitimate and would draw attention to the violations of human rights and democracy and would introduce sanctions against Lukashenko, it is only natural for Lukashenko to then lean towards Russia, which has other considerations in its relations. But then there were quite a few moments throughout his role when he would start behaving in a different way. And I basically touched upon a couple of those periods after 2008, the Russo-Georgian War after 2014, where out of a sudden he would clearly hedge and diversify his foreign policy, even when that hedging or balancing act would cause quite some irritation on the Russian side. And of course, the puzzle is that something would happen where the authoritarian leader who no longer feels threatened, either domestically or from the West, would more and more lean towards the foreign policy which is driven by the national interests of the country. And I, I call I, I tend to conceptualize what might be what this behavior is in foreign policy as uh, foreign policy hedging. I'll just quickly show you what I mean by this foreign policy hedging. And again, if you have more questions about this, we can discuss it in more detail later on. Uh, but this is uh, the model I'm working on as part of my PhD. Uh, 
so basically, in times, as I said, when Lukashenko and the Belarusian government did not feel threatened politically, uh, they would be pursuing a foreign policy, which in a way tries to combine different uh, types of international behavior. And you know, in, in international relations theory, you have two sort of, uh, let's call them conventional types of behavior, something which IR theorists would normally operate with. One of them is balancing, and that is when a state balances uh, against, let's say, against a, an external actor trying to make sure that the influence of that actor uh, does not bring about some unwanted outcomes. And usually when you balance, you look for all sorts of coalitions with some other actors who can help you with balancing uh, the, the influence and powers of the other actor. Oh, oh okay. I think we can Sorry, get someone right. just had by mistake in uh, switch their microphone on. Naya is okay. turned off. Everything is fine. Thanks. And then the second popular concept or traditional concept, if you will, in international relation theory is bandwagoning. And that is when a state, usually a small state, uh, sort of follows in the steps of a bigger power uh, in, for, in terms of foreign policy with the calculation that uh, bigger power gives it, gives it protection, all sorts of benefits. And as you remember, a couple of minutes ago, I spoke about this grand bargain between Belarus and Russia. And many people would argue that at the end of the 90s, Belarus was sort of uh, ready to bandwagon with Russia, provided that Russia would uh, give it all those resources, economic resources and general protection. Uh, so the behavior which I would call hedging is something in between the two concepts. And that's where, where you, you mix different elements of it, each together. Normally that creates quite some misunderstanding with both, in our case with Russia and the West, because some of those elements you apply simultaneously. Just you know, to give you an example, uh, in the context of the crisis between Ukraine and Russia. So as I said, Belarus would not really recognize the annexation of Crimea and would not recognize Crimea as part of Russia. But at the same time, uh, Belarus would usually support Russia uh, at the United Nations, uh, primarily during those votes at the UN General Assembly where Ukraine would try to initiate a resolution against Russia and uh, accusing Russia of violating international law in Crimea. And then Belarus would simply be on Russia's side, saying that, oh, look, we have all those commitments because we are in the Union state, in other post-Soviet groupings. That's why we have to uh, vote the way Russia votes. But then, in essence, it didn't tell you anything about the real policy. crisis and in relation uh, toward Russia. Uh, for, uh, so th that's that's just that just illustrates this uh, contradictory behavior, which is also part of the hedging exercise. But overall, this hedging, uh, you know, as you can judge by the name, is about minimizing risks, especially in situations where you do not really control uh, the flow of events, and simultaneously trying to maximize your benefits economic benefits, security benefits, and so on and so forth. And a crucial part of this is always something which can be called neutralism and bridging politics. And this is interesting because Belarus is not neutral. Uh, as I said before, it is part of uh, arrangements, including military, political, and defense arrangements with Russia, but still in the context of uh, the Ukraine situation, uh, Belarus was pursuing something which can be called situational neutrality. And after 2014, it started producing a lot of initiatives, uh, be they about you know, the situation in Ukraine or even on a broader scale. For example, at some point, uh, the Belarusian government came up with this idea about Helsinki II, saying that we 
remember we had this famous Helsinki process at the end of the Cold War, or to be more precise, it started in the 1970s, and then it helped to end the Cold War in a peaceful way, and then it helped to build institutions in European security, which uh, made sure that war, the idea of war, became the relic of the past. Now that we see all those troubles back to the European life, we need to launch another uh, Helsinki process. And Belarus and diplomats invested quite a lot of time and professional effort in that. Uh, so that's, again, I, I'm not going into further detail here, just to give you an idea of the kind of foreign policy which the Lukashenko government was trying to pursue in between those periods where he felt threatened domestically. And now, with the Belarus crisis uh, on the ground, we can see that immediately the foreign policy behavior changed. And instead of all those peacemaking initiatives, Lukashenko himself is again talking about the threats of NATO and Western countries or EU member states trying to stage a college revolution and get rid of him. He is appealing to President Putin of Russia for help and all those things. So that's quite an interesting dynamic and uh, change of not only rhetoric, but actual behavior. Uh, the crisis we've had ever since August 9 is interesting in many respects. And of course, it will take researchers many years to understand both the sources, the developments on the ground, and you know, where this crisis is going to lead to. So I'll just share a couple of hypotheses. Um, for a long time, the stability of the Lukashenko rule was due to the fact that he managed to enforce something we normally call a social contract. Social contract is a very well-known and popular concept, and the overall idea is simple. So the government offers something fundamental to the majority of the population. The population is satisfied with that, and as long as the government continues to provide for uh, those benefits, the majority of the population accepts some limitations on their political rights. And this is more or less what has been the case in Belarus until quite recently. Uh, the problem is that in order to ensure that the social contract is there, you at least need to have economic performance, which allows you to sustain or even improve the living conditions. And for about a decade between the year 2000 and 2010, well, the recent economic performance was really impressive. On average, the country's GDP grew by 7.5% every year. And you need to remember that, for example, in 2008, we had a serious uh, world economic crisis. And of course, in that year, the performance of the whole world went down. Belarus still had surplus, uh, like positive growth, but of course it was minimal. But it means that in the years preceding 2008 and in, in growth was really impressive. And that meant that the well-being of the people grew. Belarus was still far away from you know, advanced economic sta and social standards in the EU, but compared to other post-Soviet states, it did really well. But then beginning from 2011, 2012, uh, economic growth became a problem. So between 2011 and 2019, the average G annual GDP growth went down to 1.2%. So you can immediately tell the difference between 7.5% annual growth and 1.2% annual growth, which also immediately tells you a little bit about the difficulties that the government started to have in uh, providing for this, for each part of the social contract obligations. So the out aftermath of that is, is, is clear. Those people who became sort of dependent on the government in terms of their economic and social well-being started to feel that the government was no longer able to provide what it was expected to provide. 
But then another part of, of, of the population who were not dependent on the government because they were in private sector, they started to have a different kind of problem with the government. Namely, they saw that the government was rather becoming a problem for them because the government wanted to have high taxes, a lot of bureaucracy around doing business, and also all sorts of um, checks on businesses which would interrupt uh, their normal daily routine. And given that the government in Belarus had created quite some good conditions for at least some kinds of businesses, and primarily for the IT sector, at some point, a whole generation of people grew, which were very much convinced about their own abilities to earn money and to make a good living and no longer wanted the government. But since now the government needed their money because it experienced problems uh, with economic growth, it would also made those people pretty much unsatisfied with this government. And quite ironically, you now had these two different groups of people, those in the state-owned sector, dependent on the government, and those in the private sector who didn't really care about the government, but both very much unsatisfied with the government's performance and behavior. Uh, that also quickly led to some uh, changes in value systems uh, to a value gap. And of course, all that did not materialize into a political crisis immediately. But over the last several years, there were different uh, situations where all this was brewing. For example, just to give you one example, uh, around 2015, 2016, the government came up with a very, I would say, strange idea. Uh, it wanted to introduce something called the unemployment tax. In other words, those who are not officially employed were supposed to pay the government a tax and of course, the government's rationale was that quite a sizable part of the population do not work anywhere officially, but they still have good lives, a good standard of lives. And everyone understood what the reason was. The reason was that quite a lot of people either worked somewhere abroad, in Russia or in Poland, for example, and that they would bring quite a lot of money into the country and sustain their families, but no one paid any taxes. Or some people would just do business because they lived close to the border, especially the border with Lithuania and Poland. They would smuggle things and, and, and all, all those different activities. Of course, I'm not talking about millions of population, but still, you know, several thousand of people. And someone in the government got interested in that, and they thought they had to make sure that everyone paid taxes not only in order to sustain the social contract as such, but also uh, to make sure that everyone can enjoy uh, free health care, which is still free in Belarus, and some other social benefits. So in the end, they came up with this idea, which of course no one in the country understood and considered legitimate, and that brought about a mini political crisis. So not, of course, compared to what we have these days, but that was the song. And since the government had to backtrack anything which would satisfy the whole population, so step by step, all those tensions inside society started to, uh, to generate. And in the end, again, I, I won't cover all, all the developments ever since, but in the end, uh, in this summer, when the presidential election was announced and several really strong candidates uh, announced that they were going to run against Lukashenko. It was the way the government handled this political process, which also made people uh, really angry. And the government would immediately resort to quite some violence against those people. For instance, uh, there were quite a few demonstrations in July and in June, and the government would simply try to uh, disperse the demonstrators with power. And since the previous five, six years in Belarus were quite peaceful and uh, very positive in terms of developing some kind of uh, national dialogue about certain things, not, of course, about Lukashenko's rule as such, but, for example, about foreign policy and the space for NGOs was getting more and more liberalized. 
in a way, this violence came as a shock to the people because they simply forgot what it meant to live in an authoritarian state. Since this is already a new generation with all those disagreements with the government, which result from the broken social contract, it now resulted in this huge political crisis. Uh, many in society, especially those who joined uh, the protest as its active participants, expected that the Lukashenko government would fall very quickly because they thought that the level of his support was minimal. I don't think it, it, it was true. I mean, the assessment was true because even though a lot of people are really angry with him because of the broken social contract, it's still quite a sizable part of the population which would rather have Lukashenko remain in power than immerse themselves into uncertainty. Uh, by the way, we, we don't really know how big those shares are because in the last five years, we don't have any credible public opinion surveys since the government uh, closed down the few remaining uh, non-governmental uh, pollsters a few years ago. So no one has any credible assessments of, of, of that. But again, if, if we just you know observe the situation all in all, it's obvious that it's not like Lukashenko has zero support. He still enjoys some support. Because of that support, because Russia supported him as well in the context of this political crisis, we have now entered into a situation which can be called a stalemate, where the Lukashenko government is is in its weakest position ever, but he's still strong enough to survive. And the protest on the other side is as strong as never before, but it did not manage to translate the grassroots protest energy into a real political strategy that would ultimately force Lukashenko to step down. It looks like that this stalemate might last for really long, at least as long as Russia is ready to back Lukashenko. What does it mean for regional security? And that's where we're getting back to the EU, the EU's interest and potential role. Well, first of all, in terms of regional security, what happens in Belarus now might be quite a game changer for regional security. Because as I mentioned before, in recent years, Belarus was trying to be a really constructive uh, actor in regional security, being itself this newly established venue for peace talks, sticking to situational neutrality in terms of the Russian, Ukrainian, uh, let's say, confrontation, initiating lots of peace ideas. I mentioned this Helsinki II idea, but there were a few others, including more concrete ones. For example, when the uh, INF Treaty, which is about those, uh, which is one of the cornerstones of arms control, uh, in Europe. So when, when it, it was basically broken because uh, the U.S. declared it would leave uh, the treaty, uh, the uh, Belarus initiated a few ideas how to still sustain the previous level of security even in the absence of the INA. Because of this current political crisis in Belarus, all those initiatives are gone, but even more importantly, the risk can no longer be considered as a credible actor with its own independent interests in terms of security and Belarus and guarantees towards Ukraine, Poland and the Baltic states that no Russian troops would ever attack those countries from the Belarusian territory. So if all this is no longer credible, then of course it means a completely different, let's say, picture for Ukraine, for Poland, for the Baltic states, and for their allies, for that matter. And that picture will necessitate quite a lot of new investments into deterrence and defense. And the whole rationale will again be, uh, will, will become different. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry, here we go. Then what does it mean uh, for the EU? 
again, if, if all those negative developments were to take place now because of the Belarus crisis, and uh, it, it, it might be the case because, as I said before, when Lukashenko started to feel threatened domestically again, the first thing he did was reach out to the Russians and asking them for security assistance. And of course, the Russians expect him to give up his hedging, his balancing act, his situational neutrality, and to basically bandwagon with them in terms of um, military and political issues, which I would say, you know, we, we, we can treat it differently, but if we'll look at all this from the Russian lenses, then this is a very pragmatic interest on their side. So if all this were to happen now, then of course it will mean new significant challenges for security in the EU's eastern neighborhood. And of course, in terms of security as such, uh, we talk more about NATO rather than the EU when it comes to the situation. But given another level of discussion, which is about the EU's potential strategic autonomy, many states, member states within the EU argue that because of the position that the Trump administration took on international security, the EU needs to take its own strategic autonomy to a different level and needs to develop its own potential in terms of security. So all this potential growing uh, tensions in and around Belarus and Eastern Europe will only be given more arguments for those voices within the EU. Of course, now there is a lot of expectations as to the probably incoming Biden administration, even though, as you know, uh, Trump officials are still unwilling to recognize the victory by Biden. But if we assume that no big surprises come out of that situation and Biden becomes the next president of the U.S., uh, then, of course, there is a great expectation on the EU side that he will reverse many of Trump's policies and primarily in terms of how he treats NATO Euro-Atlantic alliance in general, and that's the promise that Biden himself made back in February, I think, at the Munich Security Conference, he would say that we will be back, meaning that he will reverse this course. But if we look at all this from a more structural point of view, from a realist point of view, and we, if we employ the argument that the role of individuals in foreign policy making is important, but it's not central, and then structural conditions uh, drive foreign policies, then I think a lot of people in the EU have good grounds to still think about how they should continue this discussion about the EU strategic autonomy. And once again, as I said, the situation in Eastern Europe because of the Belarus crisis might be one of the additional impulses for that. Another question which uh, the EU is now certainly dealing with again in the context of the Belarus crisis is how to promote democracy and human rights in the neighborhood. As I said in the very beginning, uh, the EU has already tried pretty much everything vis-a-vis -vis Belarus. So we tried sanctions, all sorts of sanctions. It tried engagement. It tried a combination of both. And of course, nothing has produced an ideal result. An ideal result being uh, Belarus moving towards democracy and uh, a better. Given that the EU for a long time was trying to promote its own image as the biggest uh, voice in favor of human rights and democracy, when something like this continues to happen on the EU's immediate doorsteps, it is, of course, inevitable that uh, the EU has to something about this whole situation. Uh, rethink its approaches, not just towards Belarus, but towards uh, what we call, or the EU calls the European neighborhood policy, which is a set of framework policy towards all its neighbors, or more specifically the, Euro uh, the Eastern Partnership, which is a subsection of the European neighborhood policy in a way, because it is supposed to deal with the neighbors in the East uh, and Belarus is part of that neighborhood. So the situation around the Belarus crisis is just, as I said, another reason for the EU to to re rethink those approaches. Uh, and all this, of course, different 
EU member states have different interests, which is quite obvious. And uh, normally, when it comes to Belarus, uh, the immediate neighbors of Belarus, like Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, would be the biggest voices in favor of engaging Belarus and, have, uh, and having closer relations with the country, even though its human rights record was never satisfactory. Uh, but now, in the context of this particular crisis, we see quite an opposite situation where Lithuania and Poland are the biggest voices uh, punishing the Lukashenko government, whereas some other countries, uh, primarily Germany, are trying to be a little bit more cautious, not only because of Belarus as such, but also Russia and the expectation that what the EU does to Belarus might cause reactions by the Russians. It was a little bit ironic that after the outbreak of this uh, political crisis in Belarus in early August, many EU leaders, including President Macron and Chancellor Merkel, uh, would hold phone conversations not with Lukashenko but with Putin, trying to discuss what could be done uh, with Belarus and to Belarus to make sure that the crisis would be over soon and that Lukashenko would step down. Of course, one reason is, is funny. It's, uh, it's because Lukashenko would not pick up a phone uh, when Merkel was trying to reach him. Uh, but beyond the anecdote, I think the fact that Merkel uh, was having those conversations with Putin tells us also a little bit about uh, the EU, or at least key EU member states, trying to be a little bit more geopolitical in how they approach these issues. And that's why it's also another implication of the Belarus crisis for this idea of a new, more geopolitical EU. As you also know, that uh, the current president of the EU Commission, when she was uh, selected, proclaimed that her commission would be a geopolitical commission, something very new for the EU's foreign policy thinking. So one thing is when you proclaim something like this in more abstract terms, and then you have some concepts to uh, support that claim, and then how do you put it into practice when you have a very specific crisis on your doorsteps, which is uh, the Belarus crisis in our uh, case. Okay, uh, and I think um, to conclude, as I promised, I, I, I'm just going to offer you even more questions, which are going to complicate this whole discussion even more. Uh, so, the Belarus crisis, in the end, what does it mean for the EU, for the way the EU treats its neighborhood? Is it just, you know, one single episode? And Belarus, as we uh, discussed with you, has been problematic ever since Lukashenko came to power. Or does it signal something bigger? We have the Belarus crisis, then immediately we have uh, the war around Nagorno-Karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan, which is, of course, a completely different scale of a problem and completely different challenge for EU foreign policy making. But I would even argue that because of the transformation of the international system, which was, and because of the pandemic, which seems to have accelerated that transformation and seems to have posed even more questions in terms of how international relations are going to work out, uh, given that the unipolar system is definitely given way to something new we still don't know what exactly is going to take its place, but most probably a new system which will be structured around the central axis of U.S.-China cooperation and then other regional powers trying to uh, somehow ensure their own place and their own power around that central geopolitical cooperation. And with all that, most probably, the Belarus crisis and then the Gordon Karabakh are not going to be the end of the story. So, again, my concluding question in this respect is how well is the EU prepared for this kind of foreign policy or, if you will, geopolitical uh, game? 
does it have enough, not only instruments and institutions, but does the discussion inside the EU about what the EU is and what its foreign policy should be relevant to this level of international challenges. And also, you, you probably remember that the title of this year's Munich Security Conference's report was Westlessness. Does Westlessness, given all those crises in the EU's neighborhood and the very obvious difficulty for the EU to deal with those crises, also mean EU-lessness, if I might, might put it this way? So that's, that's also a big question. And if this question is recognized, what is to be done by the EU? Uh, finally, and this is very much related to what I've just said, is, the, is it the time for the EU to make some kind of choice between, or not between, but when it comes to this dilemma between democracy on the one hand and stability and security on the other hand? Is it the moment where this choice has to be made and at what level is it supposed to be made is it just about uh, you know very specific situations and ad hoc decisions so let's say in the case of belarus we focus on human rights but then in the case of let's say ukraine we are more interested in preserving stability or does it mean something bigger is the implication bigger and does it necessitate the eu to reconsider its foreign policy as such and we can continue with all those questions. And I, I, I just wanted to emphasize with these questions that, of course, uh, the Belarus crisis is something which is super important for me. And that's why I tend to look at it in, in details because I'm from Belarus. And you know, the only way for us to resolve this crisis is to find a local solution. But for Belarus, the, uh, sorry, for, for the EU, it seems to be a much, much more fundamental uh, thing. And uh, the way it tr treats specific crises like the one in Belarus will most probably pave the way for the future of the EU in this geopolitical which has to do with the transformation of the international system. And I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop with this. I don't even know how much time I've already consumed, but I hope we'll, we'll have some left. Thank you, uh, thank you, Yaweni. I think it was really a very um, interesting presentation, you know, putting on the table the many issues uh, that we are confronted with uh, uh, these days uh, uh, regarding the relationship between the European Union and Belarus. I, I might start myself with a, with a question, and uh, um, it's, it's about really the other side of the coin, uh, uh, which is, uh, um, in the meantime, we have, I think, Giovanni Finizio, our professor Giovanni Finizio showing up. So thank you, Giovanni, for, for being with us. And um, I, I, I was just thinking about uh, um, the European Union seen from Minsk. I mean, um, why does the European Union matter? to Belarus, why should Belarus, uh, you know, worry about the European Union or considering, even consi consider the, the relationship uh, uh, with, with Brussels? Because uh, in a sense, uh, uh, first of all, you were showing us uh, how Belarus uh, is tied uh, to, uh, to Moscow and uh, to Russia. And from the, uh, the, other, the other point, or another point of view, uh, Belarus uh, seems uh, to be willing to diversify uh, uh, relationships with other countries, with uh, the neighbors. Uh, but why should uh, the government in Minsk uh, uh, look at, at the process if uh, the difference, uh, the gap uh, in, uh, um, in, in the political culture, in institutional framework is so wide? I mean, is it because of trade? Is it because of uh, legitimacy in the world? So you are friend to a group of democracies, uh, to the European Union as a normative power, and you can say, I'm still here, I'm not a rum state, uh, like North Korea or Myanmar uh, under the military junta. Uh, 
So, so is it for economic reasons, political reasons, geopolitical reasons? Why should uh, should Minsk uh, uh, take care uh, of the relationship with the European Union? I know it's a bit provocative, but in, in intellectual terms, I would say it's very interesting to know. Good question, Professor Gabuzzi. Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you, as always. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I would say that if you ask different people in Belarus, I mean, not only those in government, uh, but also in civil society and business, you will probably get different questions. But if you look at the government, it's it's very interesting. I, I had quite a lot of discussions about this with uh, all sorts of government officials. Perception of the EU is very structural and very realist and that was particularly well visible during the last five six years when as i said lukashenko gave up his authoritarian omni balance of uh, this foreign policy hedging which was based on a broad idea of the national interest whenever he would meet eu leader as in political leaders, he would always make this point that Belarus is fundamentally interested in having a strong European Union. Even more anecdotal, he would meet some high-level Br British officials, and at some point when uh, the Brexit referendum had already taken place, but then uh, th there was still some uncertainty about uh, whether it would be implemented, Lukashenko would even publicly argue that the UK should stay in the EU, because if the UK leaves, then the EU will be weakened, and we in Belarus are not interested in this. And his vision, as I said, was very, very uh, realist and structural. He would say that, I realize we have quite a few centers of geopolitical power, and if one of the centers gets weaker, it automatically means that the others uh, w will have more opportunities and more powers to enforce their will onto the smaller states that sit in between. And in this respect, he was directly referring to his sort of fear that if the EU becomes weak and not really capable of promoting its own interests in the neighborhood, then Russia would automatically uh, take it over. And, you know, my discussions with other representatives of the government show that this was very much shared on different levels of the government. But of course, economically speaking, it is also clear that uh, yeah. A small state like ours cannot even think about some kind of independent, fully-fledged foreign policy if it doesn't have this economic base. And given that the EU has been the second most important market for Belarusian goods, were Belarus to lose this market, it would automatically become this bandwagoning element of the big uh, Eurasian Russia. And that was also not... And still not easy, uh, still still not the interest of uh, Lukashenko, even though he has again entered this uh, authoritarian omni balance and stage, as I uh, called it. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, very clear. Uh, we, I, I see from the chat that we have a, a question from Mr. Gaetano Celi. I don't know if if uh, uh, Gaetano wants to. Uh, just open up the mic and uh, yes. uh, just introduce the question. Yes, do you hear me, Professor? Yes, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Preyerman, for the beautiful lecture. And uh, uh, I would like to ask you if, uh, in your point of view, is it possible that Lukashenko use uh, the, balance the balancing strategy that uh, um, you, you introduce uh, and uh, illustrate to us with the Crimea crisis and the Georgia war for a certain fear of being uh, in the future, Belarus itself a possible target for uh, Russian expansion, despite its relations and uh, dependence with Russia. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, thanks for uh, upgrading me towards a professor. I'm, I still have a long way to get there, <laughs> but it's, 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 it's very nice. Um, well, yeah. Um, you know, the very natural and immediate question most people will get when listening to this story about Belarus is why does Lukashenko need to risk his own political uh, future by basically turning towards 
hedging towards this balancing act, which irritates a lot of people in Russia. And since he's so dependent on Russia, as this current political crisis demonstrates, why would he even dare to do that? And of course, I find it difficult to respond in any way other than saying that most probably he realizes that if he simply becomes someone who is the backyard of the Russians with permanently limited cooperation with other actors, we're talking about the EU, but we also have uh, the US and China as some kind of actor's importance uh, for countries like Belarus. So if he simply separates him from anyone but Russia, this is sort of a, a highway towards losing sovereignty. And if you look at other small states, which sit in somewhat similar geopolitical conditions, you will hardly find any of them, with the exception of those which have some really big and insurmountable problems with one of their neighbors or, you know, some domestic problem related to their history or, uh, you know, uh, the composition of society. But those who don't have those problems will always somehow tend to uh, look for some kind of balance in foreign policy, balance in act, hedging. They, they will be doing something similar towards uh, other bigger powers like what Belarus is doing towards its uh, bigger neighbors. And I think that simply tells you that uh, there is this in in inherent uh, danger, fear on the part not only of Lukashenko but the uh, Belarusian government that if it's only Russia, then given Russia's aspirations on the international arena, it will simply lead to the country losing its sovereignty. And here I don't mean that there is a big expectations expectation that Russia might. Uh, you know, interfere militarily or come and stick its own flag. But we might very quickly end up in a situation where Russia conducts its foreign policy, which includes our interests, without asking us. And I think that's that's the, uh, the, the big deal for even people like Lukashenko, who, you know, are authoritarian leaders and primarily can focus on preserving their own power. Thank you. Is there any other uh, question in the chat or anyone wants to open a discussion or? May I ask a question uh, down on the chat that I had one? Yes, and also there's one from uh, Enrico uh, Bredighieri yeah. after you. So you no, well, Enrico was uh, before me, so he can go if he wants. You want to go before Enrico? Ah, okay, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if Enrico wants to go before me, but it's okay for me. Okay, and, you go. Yeah. Okay, and good morning, and thank you um, for uh, this, this lecture. Very, very interesting. And just wanting to ask to you uh, two things. The first one is, uh, um, do you think that the desire of uh, Belarusian uh, to maintain the relationship with Russia has to do with the annexion of the EU? So, uh, as you said, uh, Merkel talk, spoke with Putin about trying to uh, fix this situation, but do you think that, um, well, the... Um, an action of uh, uh, well of Germany that plays an important role in the EU and so of the EU in general uh, is uh, is due to that. And so uh, another question: Do you think that uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya um, will play a more important role than the past years? For example, uh, another important year was uh, 2010. Um, during those years, um, the opposition was uh, extremely uh, powerful as uh, uh, this year. So do you think that Svetlana may play an important role in changing the EU strategy? Thank you. Sorry, it was a bit confused. No, 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 it's, 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 it's uh, very fine questions and, uh, of course, quite fundamental questions. Uh, so the first one, 
uh, whether the EU's inaction explains why Belarus sticks with Russia. Well, what do we analyze the behavior of the Lukashenko government? And of course, we need to say that still the primary concern because of his uh, authoritarian politics has to do with how he is perceived by the EU. And here we have a, a value difference, a value problem, if you will. Because, you know, with all structural uh, factors, uh, with the EU's interest to preserve Belarus stable, we can clearly understand that it's very difficult for EU officials, both at the member state level, but also in Brussels, to accept those forms of violence that the Belarusian government refers to, especially what we've seen over the last three months. And in this respect, this value gap is insurmountable. Lukashenko himself admitted several times publicly that he understands there is no way that he and the West can become closest friends exactly for this reason. And I was in the room, for example, a couple of years ago when the Munich Security Conference uh, held its second most important event throughout the year in Belarus. And Lukashenko addressed all those, you know, high-level politicians and experts in the room. And he spent like almost an hour complaining to them about why he thinks that they mistreated him or had mistreated him all those years, saying that, oh, you know, you, you just didn't understand my intentions. And as much vocal and convincing he could be at that moment, again, I just don't see that the EU can simply remain silent when something like the violence that happened on this means going to happen. So to, 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 to cut this shot, it's, it's primarily about the values gap. But in the longer term, of course, when all actors, in my view, become a little bit more strategic, this is a, a very important and practical question you're asking. I've been long criticizing uh, EU diplomats here, and some of them you know, dislike me because of that. Uh, saying that, look, in the last five years, we had this great window of opportunity where disagreements over human rights and democracy issues were, well, still existent, but they were minimized. And the EU itself take the lead in promoting this new uh, dialogue. But while most member states, and actually Germany one, was one of the most active in that, most pragmatic, they were trying to promote something you know, material, new agreements, economic cooperation, other things. But if you look at what the EU diplomats, those representing Brussels, were doing, they invested like enormous amount of time into repeating one and the same thing. We cannot sign another economic agreement with Belarus unless Belarus introduces moratorium on death penalty. And as much as you can understand the intention, but what do we have five years later? No moratorium, the death penalty is still there. And then we have five years were much lost because only a few important agreements were concluded, whereas the others failed to be, uh, failed to be signed. And I would argue that had those agreement, agreements been signed, the EU would now have much more leverage in Belarus for the simple reason that its economic presence would be bigger. But now, you know, the economic presence is still the only game in town. So in this respect, I think there are sort of two sides to this. And then very quickly with Tikhanovska, well, um, unfortunately, I think that once Tikhanovska found herself on the territory of Lithuania, uh, he lost that very special aura and symbolism that he uh, uh, she carried for thousands of hundreds of protesters here in Belarus. And in a way, she started to behave very similar to what uh, her predecessors would do like 10 years ago. Unfortunately, we know that all those uh, attempts by them to change something only by a context in the West and primarily in the EU did not bring about anything. And again, unfortunately, I, I see that Tsikhanovsky is, is doing it. The very same thing. She's yes, she's meeting key political figures, Macron, uh, Merkel, others in the EU. But 
does that have any potential to change the situation here on the ground in Minsk? I have my doubts. And moreover, because she is in the government is making this point that, oh, she's probably now a puppet of uh, those in the EU. And of course, I'm not saying true, but I'm just saying this is a great selling point for Lukashenko to the Russians. And the Russians, even though I'm sure they, on the factual level, they know everything much better than we do because, you know, they still have this very capable uh, machine, foreign policy machine, intelligence machine. But for the Russian, this has become an existential uh, struggle, if you will, with the West, which has to do with this argument that the West interferes everywhere. And that's why Lukashenko can't even enmesh the Russians into this thinking, at least in the public realm. So unfortunately, I, I need to admit that I don't see much potential uh, from what Tikhanovsky is currently doing. Okay, thanks. Uh, Enrico um, cannot use his mic, so uh, I think I will be reading uh, his question in the chat. Enrico says, how much do you think is actually likely a Russian military intervention, uh, given how much it would worsen the overall image of Russia when it comes to political relationships with the United States of the European Union. So do you think that the military intervention is likely, unlikely, or what? I think it is not, it is not very likely. And I think that it is the last thing that uh, Moscow and Putin personally want to do. Even though when in mid-August, Lukashenko gave that call to Putin, say, asking basically his help and referring to bilateral and multilateral security arrangements, Putin responded that he was ready to support Lukashenko and that he would even, uh, the wording was, uh, Putin hold a reserve of Russian law enforcement officers in case Belarus would need them in case of the situation in Belarus would get out of control. He, he didn't even talk about the army. He spoke about Rosgvardia, which is this uh, sort of extended branch of the police. But even that, I think, for Putin was something he really didn't want. But he still made the statement, most probably because he wanted to send a very clear message to, first of all, the West and the EU. And the message was simple. Do not interfere. And even though you know, probably there wasn't any intention to interfere, but he still uh, thought it was important to make the statement. And then secondly, uh, the message was important for the Belarusian government itself and the, you know, the, the state apparatus, because at some point in mid-August, there was this overwhelming feeling in society that Lukashenko's days were numbered. And that was, of course, analytically speaking, a very wrong, wrong assessment. But then on the level of perceptions, the feeling was there. But once Putin promised his help, of course, uh, the state operators stopped to hesitate, and we didn't see many people resigning ever since. So that served the purpose. Of course, had the situation worsened to a point where there was no other option for the Russians but to interfere, unfortunately, I have no doubt they would do this. But as I said before, I think this is the worst. Uh, the, the absolute worst case scenario that they uh, they would like to to follow. Thank you again. Uh, I don't see any other uh, intervention in the chat. I have a little one more. Marta, go ahead. Sorry, but really interesting me the situation in belarus just wanted to ask uh, why do you think that um of all the 40 people that have been uh, um uh wait i can't find the verb um uh, oh i'm sorry <laughs> i just don't know how to say it well there are 40 people that have been sanctioned okay sorry mm -hmm. Um, by the EU. Why do you think that we can't see Lukashenko in all of them? Uh, well, actually, the latest uh, decision has been that Lukashenko is now part of that list. Uh, Lukashenko, his elder son, and uh, the immediate surrounding. 
But the initial argument by the EU was that by not sanctioning Lukashenko personally, they wanted to leave the space for a dialogue with him. This is a little bit you know, contradictory, you might say, because uh, look, uh, the EU refused to recognize Lukashenko as the legitimate leader. And that many people, including uh, inside the Belarusian opposition, would say that not including him in the list does not make sense for that reason. Uh, and making this point that we need to have space for dialogue with him does not make uh, sense. But pragmatically speaking, it, of course, does make sense. So the message the EU was trying to send was exactly this. So we are uh, sanctioning the others, but in your case, okay, let's enter a dialogue. Unfortunately, it was very clear from day one that Lukashenko would not enter this dialogue because basically the dialogue that the EU and the opposition wanted to offer was about Lukashenko's departure. And for that very reason, all those attempts by EU leaders to promote the idea of some kind of mediation, including OSC-led mediation, was doomed to failure right from day one. Because for Lukashenko, that was nothing else but accepting, it would amount to accepting that he would need to step down. Uh, whereas Lukashenko himself is also talking about the dialogue, primarily the national dialogue with the opposition, but his idea is different. His idea is this, you need to accept that I won this election and I'm now legitimate. But I recognize all the problems we have. I recognize that we have the political crisis in the country. And that's why my suggestion is that I'm, as a president, am now responsible for changing the Constitution to make sure that we leave this realm of superpower for the president. We diversify uh, and balance powers among different state institutions. And from that point on, we enter a new chapter in our life. And then we'll have a new election. So that's the difference. And of course, since, as I said, the EU was and still is insisting on something different, there is no way that uh, Lukashenko is going to accept that offer of a dialogue anyway. Well, I think uh, uh, our time is over because it's almost five to, uh, to four. I think it was really a, a pleasure to have you here on our series and uh, to have a, a, a speech from Minsk uh, and from uh, uh, really, uh, sorry. Speech, I would say, sorry, I, I was saying sorry. Uh, me? Who sorry. Is it? Can you? Can you Francesco, yeah. you have have one last question. If, Very uh, quick, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, actually, I have a general question. Um, in the US, um, as we know, Barack Obama warned at the time that Donald Trump presents a real threat for democracy itself, while Donald Trump is giving sign that he will not recognize the result of the presidential election because it's not in his favor. So, does this that sounds like Lukashenko? The, the, the protest in Belarus um, the aim of the protests are to uh, align the country with the Western liberal um, capitalist values, but these values are actually uh, put in danger right now. So what do you think about it? Thank you. Well, yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. I think it's uh, it's, it's, it's of course an everlasting discussion which uh, we have in this part. as a number of sovereign states after the collapse of the Soviet Union, as we discussed uh, a while ago with you. And because the Soviet Union was a different type of an ideological uh, unit and society was ideologically different, then, of course, immediately Western ideas about liberal democracy became popular among a certain st strata of society, whereas the others still hold its very different views. So that, that, that means that there's always been an... I, I would say it will continue to be uh, the case that this discussion is everlasting. When it comes to politics, of course, uh, the opinions in society about liberal democracy get projected onto uh, politics and uh, the, the kinds of discourses people have around political crises. And most of the times, this is exactly the reason why uh, 
political crisis emerge here because one part of society want to uh, stay where they are and continue with uh, the type of politics uh, that we are used to, and then another part of society wants something different, primarily liberal democracy. And as the Belarus political crisis demonstrates uh, that a growing, growing uh, part of society wants something like this. Even though I would say this is, of course, a very nuanced and difficult discussion, because at, at one level we can discuss what people want here and now and wh why they uh, go take to the streets, risk their well-being to protest against Lukashenko in the name of uh, liberal democracy. But then at a different level, the discussion is, you know, what 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 comes the overall slogan of liberal democracy in people's perceptions. And given that uh, Belarusian society and Belarusian political system has been uh, consolidated authoritarian, as we discussed, and not even a proper system of political parties exists, uh, do, do we have at least some initial institutions to make sure that liberal democracy will work? But of course, for the time being, no one asks this question. And it just continues on this uh, more uh, rhetorical level. But the very final thing, of course, I think for many people, what has been happening with and around Donald Trump, but not only Donald Trump, I mean, if you look at uh, what's been happening in some EU member states like Poland and Hungary, all that gives people a reason to think again and again about those ideals they held. And I think quite some people, uh, at least here in Belarus, are no longer that enthusiastic about, you know, he have a liberal democracy. At least they start asking more questions. Because at some point in the past, when I was, uh, you know, an undergraduate student, I remember it was very, you know, easy. It was enough to to have very vague ideas about liberal democracy, and you would immediately support them because it was something which was missing from our lives. But now I think even more and more students are asking sort of more, more nuanced and detailed questions. Yeah, so if, if, if that answers answers your question. So thank you very much again. Uh, now time is really over, unfortunately. And uh, uh, we hope that, you know, in, in the future, once this pandemic is over, you will be able to come to, to Torino and, uh, and meet us in our beautiful campus. Uh, uh, so this is my hope for the future. And of course, the hope uh, for all of us uh, is also that the European Union and Belarus relationship will uh, improve uh, in a sense, and also the political situation in your country uh, becomes uh, more uh, uh, bearable, uh, so to speak. So uh, thank you very much. And, uh, thank you. Uh, OK, but for the rest of the participants, uh, um, see you soon uh, online. I will be teaching uh, in a uh, uh, regional Europe program next uh, uh, Monday. So some of you might be able to see me again. Thank you very advertisement. much. Advertisement. Yeah. <laughs> this is a bit of advertisement, of course, uh, Giovanni. It's a quid pro quo for being uh, uh, here today. Uh, <laughs> and uh, okay, so. Uh, Thank you, Giovanni. Thank you. Eh? Thank you. My pleasure and honor. I will try to bring you to Tino, of course. Mm. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye bye. See you soon. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye.